Oh man, hello world. What is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build studio in New York City. Our next guest is truly one in a million, an author, a host, an expert communicator, the most famous astrophysicist in the world. And now he has a masterclass launching today on masterclass.com that will teach you how to think critically and communicate more clearly called Neil deGrasse Tyson teaches scientific thinking and communication. Folks, if you could believe it, Neil deGrasse Tyson is here. How exciting is that? Are you guys excited at home? Because they're, they're bouncing off the couches. Okay, now we're going to get started in just a second, but first, I believe we have a quick trailer for the series, so let's go ahead and run that clip. One of the great challenges in this world is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right, but not enough about the subject to know you're wrong. There's like a gazillion hours of me on the internet. In almost every case, I'm talking about the universe, black holes, the Big Bang, time travel, God. But what I'm gonna do in this masterclass is teach you how to think. The goal here is to train your mind how to see the world differently, how to question what others say. I've come to realize that there are three categories of truth, personal truth, political truths, at the objective truths that shape our understanding of the universe. The interesting thing about an objective truth is that it's true no matter what. Imagine that. By the time we're done, you will be equipped with some of the methods and tools so you can turn data into information, and information into knowledge, knowledge into wisdom. We all have susceptibility and bias. Search engines on the internet are the epitome of confirmation bias. And you're gonna use that as evidence that you are correct? No. The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. What does it mean to be skeptical? What does it mean to be convinced by data? A proper skeptic questions what they're unsure of, but recognizes when valid evidence is presented to change their mind. I will equip you to not only find objective truths, but then communicate to others how to get there. It's not good enough to be right. You also have to be effective. The less connected you are to what is objectively true, the less likely you will be able to make decisions that will benefit your life, your life, the life of your family, and even civilization itself. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, and this is my master class. Ladies and gentlemen, make a ridiculous amount of noise. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson right here. Come on. You shouldn't have to require people to make noise. It should, it should, it should come organically out of them. Well, I didn't think I... I, I <laughs> See, now, in that instance, in a way, you solicited that noise. Maybe not intentionally, but you did bring it up and kind of cause it to happen, did you not? I, that was not my intent. Well, I, I, I apologize if I demanded noise. <laughs> I didn't, that wasn't my intent either. But I do feel it appropriate. I think you are an individual that warrants a little bit of noise upon arrival. Well, I want to earn it in this, in this interview. And then... Some would argue that perhaps you have. I will argue okay. that for you on your behalf because it's uncomfortable for an individual to say they have. So I will tell you that you have. Okay, thank you. Okay, there we are. Wonderful. Uh, Sir, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, congratulations. I'm very excited to talk to you about Masterclass. Uh, I, I love all of the classes they have. I'm very excited to dive into yours. Uh, before we get to any of that, very simple question. How are you? Oh, fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you for asking. That's yes, okay. yes. That's important to me. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I care about the universe and the universe is fine. It's Earth that's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> Universe is all right, but locally. Locally, we have issues. There's yeah. some stuff going on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, it's so great to have you here, and uh, thank you to our audience for coming and hanging out with us. We're going to have a good time today. Uh, Masterclass, let's, let's dive right into it. As a fan, and, and I'll be the first to say, there is no shortage of content for me to listen and hear you talk about stuff, but I believe this is the first time that you've talked about this particular stuff, the, the approach to how you think and how that works. How did this happen? How yeah, a little bits of this might have come out in 
other occasions, but never as an organized delivery of content. Typically, in the, the YouTube videos that I'm in or anything else, I'm talking about the universe. People want to know about black holes, quasars, the sun, exoplanets, Pluto. You know, this, these are topics that, that yes, if, if you have my attention and you're curious, that's typically what you ask about. Yeah. Rarely does someone come up to me and say, how do you communicate? Or what are you thinking about when you do? In fact, what typically happens is people will see some encounter I have with a talk show host or on stage, and they say, oh, you're such a natural. <laughs> and I say, you have no idea what's under the hood that I'm doing. It's not their fault, but there was no real occasion for me to explore that with an audience until this master class was requested of me, and I said I'd be delighted. Well, one of the things, I wrote down the name as soon as I came across it in your most recent book. I think it was your most recent one, the, the Letters from an Astrophysicist. Letters from an Astrophysicist. Yes, and I wrote down, it was a letter from David Swaim in Iowa Park, Texas, who asks the exact question that this master class answers, which is, how, how do you communicate the way you do? How do you think? And, and I'm curious, how do you approach designing a lesson plan to communicate the way you communicate. It feels daunting. So first of all, that letter that you referenced was actually from a prisoner. Yes. And That's why the number was there. Oh, <laughs> you wondered. <laughs> I was like, that what was not his phone number. I was like, what that an interesting <laughs> footnote. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a prisoner. He is writing from prison. And he was concerned because he loves some topics and he wants to tell his fellow prisoners and no one is interested in what he's saying. And, and he said, he, and it was a very complimentary letter, he said, when he hears me speak, it's as though I anticipate his next thought. And that there's a, we're walking step, by, in, in step, lockstep together as I speak and as he learns. It was a very high compliment. He wanted to know what was going on. So you're absolutely right to find that in there because that, that, that was an occasion for me to give a snippet of what's in this class. That, that, that's all. I often, when I, when I think about myself, I think about uh, thinking and the way I think, I, I uh, imagine it akin to breathing. I don't think about the way I think, I just do. Right? I think about the way I think all the time. Interesting. All the time. All the time. All the time. Is that uh, a burden? Is that uh, uh, all-consuming? No. Is that difficult? I, I think about words. I think about the rhythm of phrases in a sentence, how they land, how they land if you read it, relative to how they land if you hear it. And not all sentences work equally. I remember giving a talk, and so oh, we want to transcribe this. I say, no, don't transcribe it, because I'll write it. If you need something written, I'll write it, and I will write it differently than how I speak it, because your eye-brain connection is different from your ear-brain connection, and I think about this. And so, uh, and I pay attention when I'm communicating with people. Uh, are you dozing off? Are you, are your eyebrows lighting up? Are you turning away from me? Are you turning towards me? I make note of this. I, I make note of what I'm saying when you react in all those ways. And it depends how old you are, okay? If you're young, you're gonna react to different stimulus than if you're older. And if you're really old, if you're, real, if you're like old timer, senior folks, I might pull some references from the Second World War, something that they lived through, something that they cared about, something that goes un, uh, not as much recognized about the sacrifices that people put in. Um, today, we don't think as much about it as they do because they live through it. I will find a way to weave that into what I'm talking about. And you're parsing all this data in real time. Real time. Well, 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 well. So, so, yes, what's coming out of my mouth is in real time. Right. But I walked into the room with, I, I think it was a utility belt, okay? okay? So, uh, a utility belt. In that utility belt are reference frames that I can draw randomly. It's random access reference frames for any given moment that I'm in. So... Yeah, I, you know, who won that football game this past weekend? That, I have that score in here, Tuck maybe. Tucked that away. Yeah, yeah. It's tucked away, it's right here. Um, you know, uh, what's the status of Baby Yoda? Okay, that's in this. You had a controversial talk. Baby Yoda tweet. Apparently, <laughs> you had I was a little late to the party on my controversial Baby, Baby Yoda, Yoda tweet. <laughs> I tweeted Baby Yoda last night, or was it this morning? And I, I said, Baby Yoda, 
uh, cute, but creepy he still is. <laughs> <laughs> and the and internet people lost their mind over there. Not responding what? kind. What? No, wow, wow. But anyhow, so I gotta know like who Baby Yoda is right. in order to even be there. Are you are you at a point where you're consuming content purely to store it as reference points for future engagements and conversations? Almost ev almost everything I do in pop culture is entirely for that purpose. It's not just in a conversation, it's as an educator in the conversation. Okay, so so uh, I'm not just doing it to be the life of a party. I'm doing it so that I can communicate knowledge, wisdom, insight, science better because we all are pop culture fluent. That's the definition of pop culture. That's what pop culture means. You know who Beyonce is even if you never heard any of her songs. You've heard the name. You know, you know th there's certain cultural commonalities. Yeah. And if I plug into those cultural commonalities, think of it as a scaffold. You walk in, we, we greet each other and you walk in with a scaffold and I take a look at that scaffold. I say, okay, now I take science, wisdom, insight, logical thinking, rational thinking, and I clad your scaffold with that content. And you will absorb it because I'm attaching it to something you already care about. And then when we're done, you walk away, and now you've got stuff attached to something you care about, and ideally, you'll never forget it. My best example of this is I was at home. Uh, I, something ended at 5.30. I'm channel surfing. And 5.45 comes around. is a football game that just ended. And I'm waiting for a movie to come on at 6, OK? Football game just ended, but it ended in a tie. So they got to go into a 15-minute overtime. OK, I'll fit that in. Watch it over time in football, it can't be bad. So I'm watching it, and after the requisite exchange of possession before it becomes sudden death, we're in sudden death mode. And then the Cincinnati Bengals come within 55 yards of the goalpost, and they go to kick a field goal. So they do, and they kick it, and the ball rotates up, and there it goes. And it hits the left upright, and it careens in for the win. And I said, whoa, wait a minute, let me check on that. So I made a quick calculation, and then I tweeted. The game-winning field goal in the Bengals, I forgot who they were playing the game, was aided by a third of an inch deflection to the right brought upon by Earth's rotation. People lost their minds over there. Oh, but there was a headline in a Cincinnati newspaper, God helped Cincinnati win the thing. So, so my point here is, it's very simple. In that tweet, I don't have to explain what football is, what a field goal is. I don't have to explain any of that. What overtime is. You came to the table knowing this. And so I added to it something that's kind of cool, kind of interesting. And it's the second tweet that I said, oh, by the way, this is called the Coriolis force, and it's what makes uh, hurricanes uh, rotate in the directions that they do. So that's like the second level information. First level information, the rotation of the Earth basically won that game for Cincinnati. Second tier, you've got to get a little deeper dive. I get dive. a little deeper. Once I got your attention, yeah. now I get to throw in a little, a little Coriolis force. How early on in, in your life, in your experience, did you realize that you had the ability to connect these dots, to communicate in this way? Is this something you've always been comfortable doing? Is it a skill you've developed over time? Uh, kind of, yeah, yeah. I, I was, the first talk I ever gave, and they like paid me to give this talk, uh, I was, had just turned 15. And uh, I gave a talk at City College to a whole room of adults. And there was a comet coming in the sky. This is long ago. I'm way, I'm way old here. There was a comet coming in the sky, and it was going to be really bright during Christmas. It was going to be the Christmas comet. And uh, I knew about it. I had photos, and I, I was fluent in the universe, having known that that was my life calling since age nine. And so I showed pictures that I took that previous summer of the universe, talked about the comet, what it's about, what it's made of, what the, the past, present, and future of them are. And then like, they paid me for that. They said they wanted me to come back for more. I, thought, I felt kind of cheap, because I was only sharing with people what I loved. I was just, it's like describing what your living room looks like. 
And so I think, at least initially, no, I wasn't trying to find out what pop culture things to connect to. I was just sharing my enthusiasm for a subject that I loved. And I think any of us who've been in college, we remember most the classes where the professor was most enthusiastic right. about what it was they're teaching. And it didn't matter what they were teaching. That's the interesting thing. Right. Some of your favorite classes are not necessarily the ones in your major. They're the ones where the professor, it was a joy for the professor to, 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 to walk up and down the class and just celebrate the knowledge, wisdom, and insight that they'd gleaned in their, in their field. It was entertaining is what it was. And you were captivated. The, the, it's, the, that enthusiasm, it's infectious. It, it's contagious. Um, you know, I'm very curious about, you say as someone who thinks about the way you think all the time, it, I, I wonder if doing this, if creating the master class uh, caused you to sort of think a little harder because now you have to map it out. You already know how it works in your head, but you got to put it on paper. And so through that process, did you discover anything about yourself, about the way you think? Did you unlock new stuff by exploring it? That's a it? perceptive question, so you're right. I, you can know how to do something, but if you've never actually taught it before, the, the organization of it needs to be thought through mm -hmm. in some kind of rational, sensible way. Right. So yeah, I, when I laid out all the things I did, I laid out uh, tactics that I go through, and then I had to sort of sort, you know, uh, nip tuck, Slide, slide in, slide out, and until it could come across as a coherent presentation. Did I learn anything about myself? No, not really, because I'm, I'm mining what is already there yeah. for the benefit of a viewer. Yeah. And so, uh, so it, is, it is kind of meta to say, how do you teach about teaching if you've never taught about teaching before? But no, I, I was still nonetheless comfortable in that element. Uh, the class, it's, it's launching today. It's on masterclass.com. We're, we're not done yet. I just want to make sure that we, we cover that. Everybody knows where to find it because it's, it's going to be phenomenal. I got a chance. We all watched the trailer. It's amazing. It's an honor to be in the company of all these very yeah. well-known, high-class actors, musicians, uh, comedians, um, people who you know are at the top of their game. And you want a little piece of that, just to maybe some of that could shed some luminosity on your own ambitions, even if your ambitions are not exactly aligned with the expertise of the person. Often the takeaway is just what are the struggles they overcame right. to get to where they are? What are the, uh, how much um, energy was required to overcome naysayers, to overcome something you might have attempted and then failed at it? Did you have the, the energy and the, the resilience to come back? Almost every successful person you've ever met, if you ever sit down with them, just tell me some stories about what you've been through. They will tell you when they were at the bottom. Nobody is always at the top. And in fact, it's the bottom where so many of the great lessons are learned. And what you have to do is be able to parcel those lessons into insights and wisdom that you can carry forward. And that's the thing that I think, because uh, I've watched uh, the Aaron Sorkin one, that Steve Martin teaches comedy. They have so many. And what these classes do that I think is lost, uh, if you haven't seen it before, people think it's not, it's not just nuts and bolts. It, it's all those stories. It's that journey. It, it's, it's all the little things in between that connect the dots from point A to B. And it, uh, it, so and, it's and really in the, cool. In this, I give examples of, in, of interviews that I had in late night television where, and a few of those, they, they found the clips and they're, they're used. Oh, nice. uh, so you see the interview and I tell you what's going through my head at the time the interview is happening. And again, there are many people say, oh, you're such a natural, you're this. Meanwhile, I am calculating, gears are turning. What is he gonna ask next? How is he gonna ask it? How am I gonna reply? Who is this show's audience? Because ultimately, that's who you're talking to, not the host. Do you know who that audience is? And it reminds me, one of my interviews, um, I'm very proud of something. I've got, I, I've stole coffee mugs of every show I've been interviewed on. I don't, I don't wanna, I got a box like a hundred of these upstairs. I will what? happily. What, what are you talking about? I have no idea what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, go for yeah. it. Um, so, you know who does so Louis Anderson does that as well. I, so I have a coffee <laughs> mug of every show I've ever been on where I wasn't caught stealing their coffee mug. And 
And I looked at it the other day and I said, wow, that's a pretty wide range. It's, that's a wide range from evening comedic news to the morning news to the, ev the evening news to people's podcasts. Um, one of my favorite cups is I was on Rachel Ray, and, but she didn't have a cup with her name on it. They're these random cups. I said, what, where, what? I, I felt cheated, right? <laughs> so, so, I, so, I, so I grabbed the cup, she said, I'll, I'll sign it for you. So I have her, sign, Rachel Ray signed. So that one is one of my favorite ones. But the, uh, one of the shows, so I just, the range, and every time I look at it, I'm, I almost have a little flashback about what I had to do to be the best I could on that show. And one of the shows was uh, um, uh, uh, Dio Sin Miro. Did I say it right? Desus, Desus. Oh, Desus and Miro. Desus Miro. Yeah, okay. okay. I know the show you're talking about, yes. Very hip. It's like the hippest, like, I'm, I'm there in a jacket and a button-up shirt, and no one, everyone there is in hoodies. Every, they, I felt <laughs> overdressed, yeah. okay? And the only thing I could connect with was one of them is wearing a Yankee hat, mm -hmm. and one of them is, like, from the Bronx, and I'm a Yankee fan from the Bronx. There you go. You're in. So I said, okay. I have a fallback place I could go to if this gets if this gets awkward, okay? So we're talking about really hip things, and I'm trying to like pretend I'm hip. And one of, one of the at these one one last question we got to ask you. I say, say what? And they said, "Who's your favorite member of the Wu Tang Clan?" It was like, huh? <laughs> uh, okay, so all right, uh, Wu Tang Clan. Yes, I know who they are, but I only know one member of the Wu Tang Clan. I can't recite them all. I, 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 so I so I. <laughs> This is all going through my head, right? Exactly. Like, like, I don't know how long this yeah, took. Right. Maybe in the, in the replay, I'm just staring into space. I don't know. But Neil, you've been quiet for 23 <laughs> minutes. Uh, are you okay? Are we... like, so I said, the Jizza, of course. And they said, oh, good, 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 good. So he was the only member of the Wu-Tang Clan. Had, yeah. I, that's all I had. <laughs> And in, in all fairness, I did interview the Jizza for my radio show. There you go. And he's actually quite academically infused, creatively and intellectually. So I, I response. Yeah. yeah. And the Jizza is is I think that's some variant on being the genius. That's there's some uh, 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 distortion of that word to become the Jizza. But anyhow, that's uh, this is what I what I go through to do this, yeah. and just to, so I can serve an audience. That's all. That's that's that, that, that's all I'm trying to communicate here. Uh, well, you're very good at it, and I appreciate all the work you go through. Even just before this very talk, we had a conversation. How long do you want the response to be? Just like to watch the wheels turn before I even got out here, and to be a part of it is very cool. And I appreciate. Uh, we are that. in New York City. That is very much a fact. Know. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, so, so thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. And by the way, I tell a story about I was invited to give a commencement speech mm -hmm. at a high school in Brooklyn. And so I sent a series of questions. By the way, what's the most boring part of any commencement? The commencement speech, okay? So I'm trying to do a little better than the most boring part of the commencement. So I asked, well, how many people are graduating? Um, then I started asking about the demographics. Um, how many boys, how many girls, how many, uh, uh, what, what percentage of the graduating class qualify for free lunch? You know, the, the, so I get a sense of, the poverty level, right. what percent go on to. And the principal wrote back to me and said, why are you asking these questions? <laughs> I said, I want to know who I'm talking to. That shouldn't matter. If you have a message, it shouldn't matter who. And this is the principal. This is an educator who's asking me this. And I'm saying, it does matter, it does. OK? I want to know how many of them are going to college. Because I'll describe college in a way that will serve the interest of that audience. I want to know how many girls are graduating. Because there's certain fields where, where forces are more against you. And I'm going to say things that might boost up your confidence. Okay? The sciences are still trying to figure out how to boost those numbers. I want to know this. Yeah. Okay? Don't tell me, give the one message. Yeah. And that shouldn't matter who... I'm screaming here. I'm sorry. Because I'm remembering <laughs> how I felt. Yes. I'm remembering this. Goodness, and it could be something as simple as a word in a sentence that piques someone's interest. It's not a whole different, uh, it's, I, yes, I have some important things I wanna say, but how I shape it, I wanna maximize how that information is received by your receptors. And your, your receptor is different from his receptor, from her receptor, they're different. Yeah. And if you think they're the same, you probably didn't enjoy school in life. 
okay? Because nothing fit what, what, what you were trying to learn. I, I listened to you talk about now, Calm this. down now. No, it's Sorry. quite all right, please. This is why we came out of the house. Uh, I listen to you talk, and the way you describe it, I, uh, for me, it sounds as what it would be like to experience life seeing the matrix, like understanding the code. Because there are a lot of people that leave it up to the universe. They leave it up to, it's alchemy. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to do what I do, and I'm going to connect with people, and I'm going to figure it out. But you, you do that, but you do it supported by data, and it fascinates me. I, I love the matrix analogy. It is my single favorite movie. Ever so to see the matrix. Tell me how wrong I was by using that analogy. Now it was, gonna... it was a, a beautiful, beautiful analogy. Oh, thank you. Yes, oh my God. you see, you see the matrix, yeah. and you have access to the programming exactly. of, or in this case, just the the learning engine that exists within us all, whether or not you even had an engine to learn. And I see it as part of my duty, responsibility, to find out what that engine is, where is it? And has, has it been stoked lately with, yeah. with fuel? Maybe they're just embers that need to be fanned so that they can reignite. Maybe your embers burned out and it takes a little extra effort for me to sort of re, re uh, uh, um, sort of get the spark yeah. going again. Stoke the flame. Stoke the flame. Yeah. And, and, but no, make the flame if it had totally burned out, even through the embers. And you asked me earlier about setting up a lesson plan. It's not about lesson plans. Yeah. It's not that. Lesson plan is, here's what you do when, oh, uh, here's everything I want to teach, so let me put out this, it is a lesson plan. I'm a little more, a little more fluid than that. Okay, in one of my books, a couple of books ago, um, uh, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Yes. That is not an astrophysics lesson plan. Oh no, what I did was I looked at my big fat astrophysics textbook and I said, well, let's get rid of that. That's not interesting. How about that? No, no, no. Let me, I can boost that, that. And that book is my curated selection of the most mind-blowing things in the universe. And then, if after that you become interested in the universe, you'll say, well, tell me more about this. Well, here we go. This is a, a fatter book. Right. Another book. Here's more detail. But if uh, first out of the box, no. You don't leave, leave the detail. No. No. You lead with the exciting stuff. Yes. Why yeah, I get hooked. I um, obviously am made of questions, but it is very important to me that I leave as much time as possible and we get to some of our audience questions. I've got at least five. I'm going to try to do all of them. Let's go ahead. We've got microphones out there. We've got plenty of time. The first question, you're holding a microphone. I believe it to be you, sir. Go for it. Are you reading a question on your smartphone? You, you, can't, you can't remember the question. Put the, I'm nervous. Close it down. <laughs> look what at could me. you possibly be nervous about, look sir? Look at me and tell me the question. All right. Don't look down. Go. All right, All right. first, um, you inspired my mustache. Oh! <laughs> okay, just so, just so you know, uh, a little known fact, I have never in my life shaved my upper lip. Oh. So any... The first time I could possibly grow a mustache, there was one been there ever since. And it used to be more in style in my day than it is today. So but if you help bring it back, that'd be, that'd be cool. Okay. Thank you. So my question is, um, growing up in the Bronx, where, where- I like you say that, the Bronx. You caught how he said that, the Bronx. That's how you do that. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> so what inspired the courage um, for you to stand out and be different and not become a product of your environment? Beautiful question. There were forces operating against it, very much so. I succumbed to some of them. So in my day, long ago, the, there weren't many options that were nurtured among people with darker skin color. If they come up and see you have any sort of athletic talent at all, oh, you have to be an athlete. Go join the team, and then the coaches come find you, and you have transportation to and from after school. And so, so the system was streamlined for me to become an athlete. And if anyone who had any musical talent, and you're black, streamlined to express that musical talent. Because the singing and dancing and doing sports is what was expected. If you had any interest that differed from that, no, there was no overt, there was nothing over, it was just more subtle. It was, well, why do you want to do that? Don't you're good at this? Why don't you want to do that? I could run fast, I could jump high, I could slam dunk a basketball in ninth grade. Okay? So people say, you should be a basketball player. I say, 
I don't want to be a basketball player. I like physics. I like, man, I want to be in the physics club. Oh, but if you're in the physics club, there's no ride home afterwards, but we can, have, and, and, and so, so I had to be persistent. And since I've known what I wanted to be when I grew up, since but between age nine and 11, I have very deep fuel tanks to serve that interest, to resist the forces that would otherwise have me do what they wanted me to do rather than what I wanted to do. And in fact, I would become a very good athlete. I, I wrestled in college and in high school. In high school, I was undefeated and captain of the team. And at the end of all of this, I, I, I had to come to this revelation. When I was older, I said, I think I became an athlete more because of the expectations of others than from anything that was genuine within me. That was an upsetting realization. I don't regret doing athletic things. I enjoyed it, it was good camaraderie, especially in the team sports. So I don't, I don't wanna pitch it quite that negatively, but I needed forces. And the kids in the street who, who might have otherwise put greater pressure on me, forget formal forces, peer pressure. But since I could slam dunk a basketball and I did run fast, I was able to hold up my sort of street cred and not be ostracized by the neighborhood forces that would otherwise reject who you might be. So in that sense, I, I think I slipped by. Yeah. Thank you so much for your question, man. Nothing to be nervous about. We've got uh, a couple more. Let's go for it, right in the front. Hi. Hey. So I just took an introduction to cosmology class here in NYU, right? You're an NYU student? Yeah. Cool, what are you majoring in? I'm doing psychology and data science, so. What, are you doing psychology and you're taking a cosmology course? Yeah. <laughs> Fist bump up on that one, all right. All right. So I realized that a lot of our time, and our, I mean, cosmologists and astrophysicists time, is going and just like calculating and recalculating and calibrating these numbers. Um, and like the Hubble constant, for example, my professor said, like changes every other week and we're trying to, like we keep skipping around. My question to you is, if we could magically, someone could gift you uh, a very accurate and precise number, whatever you ask for, some value, um, what would you ask for that would you think further science the most, like push us forward the most? You can ask for any value, and it would magically give you the true value uh, to an amazing precision. Okay, so that's an interesting question for two reasons. Okay. First, it comes with an assumption that's not really true. You're assuming that precise measurements to like unlimited precision get you closer to some deep truth in the universe. And there are many occasions where that's just not the case. If you have the approximate answer, you're good and you can move on, okay? I look at you, I don't, how, how, how tall are you? Like five two and You're five two, and okay. And a half, okay. Take that a Fine, yeah, that half. Don't take that away. Well, suppose I can measure it, you're actually five feet, 2.375865 inches. That's really precise, but is it useful to you at all? No, you're about five, two and a half. The rest of that is pointless precision. That's true. Okay, so there's a lot of science where precision is useful, and science where we got approximately the right answer, we're good here. Hmm. So it's like saying, how big is the sun? Whoa, wait, I, I got a better, a better answer. You ready? Yeah. The answer to a question that involves a measurement is an arbitrarily agreed upon number. For example, you can say, how big is the sun? Well, I can tell you it's 864,000 miles in diameter. Is it exactly that? No, it's probably 864,292. Did you care about the 292? Yeah, I did. Okay, fine, care about it. Now I ask you, what's, in what wavelength of light do you want to know the diameter of the sun? Okay. Because different wavelengths of light emanate from its surface at different depths. That's gonna matter to the answer. And then when you get all these details, and the sun is wider at the equator than it is pole to pole. Are you asking for the equatorial diameter or the pole to pole diameter? So the answer that you walk away with, you have to just be comfortable 
with just some agreed upon way to go about and get that number. You know what started all this? I forgot who asked the question first. It was, what is the length of the coastline of England? Hmm. Well, go get a map. It's kind of, it's curly, so you can't put a ruler on it, so a good way to get a string. Hmm. You do the string, you go around, then you unfurl the string, put it on the scale, so, oh, it's, a, you know, 800 miles, whatever, I forgot the, the number. Hmm. But wait a minute, um, suppose the map were bigger, like this big then you could put more nuance on that border. So now the string has got a little extra moves in it. Now, what is the length? It's gonna be a little longer, isn't it? Well, let's get a really big map of England. In fact, let's get England, okay? <laughs> and let's get a really long string. And it, here it is, well, I have a boulder here. Do I go around the, which side of the boulder am I gonna go around? On the coastline. Wait a minute, did you do this at high tide or low tide? The coastline is where the land meets the water. So at some point you say, fuck it, okay? I'm just gonna, excuse me, I just, could you beep that? Uh, it's live, it's the internet. You oh, don't have sorry. To. So Unless you want to, but we don't have say, to. You can say whatever you want. I am tired, okay? Let's just agree, you're not gonna go around this boulder and I don't care where the tide is, just, uh, so, so your question, though, though, Asked in earnesty, mm -hmm. earnesty, on, asked in, earnest. with with earnest, with earnest, with earnest yes. is not always what matters mm -hmm. in the advance of our understanding of the universe. So precision doesn't matter as much, but like as much as you might think. But would you say that we should divert our attention to some to finding some value that we maybe like humans aren't paying as much attention to, according to you? <sighs> no, because it's not the measurement of numbers; it's the understanding of things about which we have no idea what's causing it. Dark matter, dark energy. How do you go from organic molecules to self-replicating life? That's not the measurement of a number, that's an idea, an understanding of how nature behaves about which we are clueless. Yeah, it'll involve some measurement, how long does a cell live, how, you know, what is the uptake of chemicals? Yeah, they involve measurements. But the precision of a number is not likely to matter in the search for the answers to those questions. That being said, 120 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, forgive me, I forgot who said this. Someone says, someone says I want to go into physics, which is a very esteemed professor. I want to go into physics. What should, how, how, what should I do? He said, no, don't go into physics. All of physics has been discovered. This is like 1890s. All, classical physics has all been done. Gravity, there's just some few numbers on the horizon, it's just some clouds on the horizon. We'll work out those numbers, but physics henceforth will just be finding the next decimal place. That's what that learned professor told a student coming up. And you know what happened? It turned out that the measurements in those next decimal places ended up separating from one another, and the solution to that was the discovery of quantum physics. Because nature started behaving badly down in the smallest of the regimes, where you involve particles, and particles interacting with photons of light, yeah. okay? In that case, those careful measurements opened up an entire new branch of physics. Wow. So, I, I, don't, I didn't want you to sit down thinking you didn't come from anywhere on that question. All right. <laughs> I, uh, I severely underestimated the capacity for follow-ups in this crowd. Uh, <laughs> we're, no, I, can, I can do soundbite answers. Let's, do, let's get one more in. Okay, how about two, and I'll answer it each in half of the time. Let's try that. So I did the math on that. That let's works go. out. So okay. let's go one more. All right, go. Let's do another one. Yeah. Uh, okay, so quickly, quickly, like you've been a hero of mine forever. I can't wait to watch this master class. So, um... It seems like most of the things you were talking about were self-taught, but I was wondering if any time in your life you had a teacher who did something or said something to you and you were kind of like, oh, I can use that or, or that really affected me in a way. Great question. So I, most of what I did is self-taught that is happened outside of the classroom. So in that regard, I, there are no teachers I can really point to in the way one traditionally says this teacher changed my life. There is a teacher in sixth grade who noticed that I was disruptive in class. I still have the report card 
from sixth grade where she says, less social involvement and more academic diligence is in order. Okay, she was not the first to critique my social energy. Sixth grade, I'm 11 years old. I kind of already know what I'm interested in. As I said earlier, the universe had called me from age nine. All my book reports were on cosmic topics. And she saw this unbridled energy. She came to me after school and handed me a list of classes for adults taught at the American Museum of Natural History's Hayden Planetarium. And these classes were on the universe. And she said, you might be interested in this. I took it home, showed my mother, she said, yeah, that's kind of cool. I know you like this, let's do it. It cost money, so I didn't have, the, so it required parental support. I went and took those classes. They're after school, they're at night. So all of a sudden, my social energy in the class was sort of sucked away and was devoted to these other activities that further enhanced my understanding of the universe and simultaneously made her class easier to, to manage because I was less disruptive. So yes, that teacher put me in a direction where now I am director of that same planetarium that served my educational and scientific interest back in elementary school. Well done. Yes. <laughs> we got her right. One more, one more. Got, oh! I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so, oh! I failed you. Did you have a question back? I she failed. had a question in the back row. I'm in sure. the back row. I can't do it. Here, I can't, I got to wrap this up. I'm so sorry. It is my fault. I have failed you as a moderator. I'll but... give her a one word answer. How about that? Real quick, go, go, quick. If it's not quick. one word, I'm cutting the cameras. <laughs> but she doesn't have a microphone. Nobody can hear. Are you opening a winery, yes or no? Oh, I'd Maybe. rather drink wine than make it. There it is. Right. <laughs> well done, team effort. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being an incredible audience and hanging out with us. Masterclass.com. And yes, keep doing that, because this is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Go, masterclass.com. Go check it out. Thank you. Thank you.